Church. Good morning, church. What a great day it is to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. And a joy and a blessing to have each and every one of you here with us this morning. If you're a guest, we just want to say welcome and thank you so much for being here this morning. In the bulletin, we do have this connection card. And if you would, if you're a guest with us, if you'd fill this out, we would just love to follow up with you and get to know you. And again, we so appreciate you joining us this morning. If any of you have any prayer requests or praises, please let us know on the bottom of the connection card and we will be praying for you and we can add you to our weekly email, the prayer email that goes out each Tuesday. On the back, it has our weekly ministry opportunities and where you can sign up for our Wednesday night meal if you'd like to join us for a good time of food and fellowship, okay? So make sure to fill out those connection cards. Again, even if you just need to update your information, you can do that through the connection card. A few announcements. Uh, we do have our church ministry fair today. It's going to be a great time. Right after this service, you can head over to the Family Life Center. We're going into the gymnasium, the gym. We have some tables set up where you can learn about all different ministries and teams you can get involved in for just serving the Lord together. So join us for that. After being in there for a little while, we're going to have some good fried chicken and some good sides. Amen. All right. So come join us for some good food and good fellowship and learning about the different ministries. We will not be having our evening services tonight, so no evening services tonight uh, due to the ministry fair. A third on the back table there by Mr. Mickey is the, uh, we have the sign up for the trunk or treat and the fall festival coming up. If you'd like to do a game in the gym or if you'd like to decorate the trunk of your vehicle, I know we had close to, I think, 400 people come through our parking lot last year that we got to get, send a hot dog box with the gospel message and invite them to church. We would love for you to get involved. I'm looking for more people to sign up. So sign up on that sheet. It's going to be October 31st from 6 to 8 o'clock here at the church parking lot and in the gym. We are still looking for candy donations too. So bring that candy to the church office. I promise we won't eat it. We'll save it for the night of the trunk or treat, okay? Yeah. But we are looking for that. Fourth, this coming uh, Wednesday... We're going to be going and feeding the Bearcats at Sam Houston State University. This is through the Baptist Student Ministry uh, once a semester. So twice a year we go and we serve a meal to the college students there. If you'd like to help out, we're going to be meeting at the Family Life Center this Wednesday at 9 a.m. to prep the food into boxes. And then if you'd like to go with us, we head out to the university to serve the college students. We usually get back around 1.30 or so. But if you'd like to volunteer and help out, please let myself know or let Carol Horn know, okay? But we're looking for volunteers this Wednesday for that. Um, I think that's pretty much it. There's a few more announcements. Make sure to read over your bulletin. Let us know if you have any questions. And let's go, go to the Lord together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this morning. As always, Lord, it is just a joy and a blessing to be together in your house. And Lord, I thank you for each of these here, my brothers and sisters in Christ. I thank you for those who are on the live stream this morning, joining us that way. We thank you for them, and we pray for them, Father. Lord, we thank you for this time that we have now to come and to worship you in song and praise and through the studying of your holy word. Lord, I ask you be with Brother Ethan and the choir and the band as they lead us in song and praise. And Lord, please be with Pastor Greg as he brings your word to us. May you just speak through him by your spirit. May we hear what we need to hear from you this day. And Lord, may we not just hear your word, but may we be obedient to your word. May we faithfully serve you and live for you. And may you get all the glory and the honor and the praise. We just love you. We thank you for this day. We commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Christ the Lord is risen today. Christ the Lord is risen today.
exciting. Our Lord is risen. He is not dead. Let's sing this out. Sword. Love the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. <laughs>
good to see you here today. It's good to be here today. And it's good to see all of you here today for our combined service. After we finish in the sanctuary, we will be moving over to the Family Life Center and spending time together in a ministry fair. A lot of questions have come up asking about the teams that will be showcased during this time. And so hopefully Rick can shed some light on it for us. Well, I'll do my very best. Several years ago, our church adopted and voted to move to a team concept for accomplishing the ministry goals of our church. We have two distinct ways to accomplish that. One is through committees. Committees are very different from teams insofar as you have to be a church member. You have to have been a member for six months or more. You have to be elected by the church to serve and you can only serve in that capacity for a three year period. And then you have to roll off before you can come back. So if you're passionate about a particular committee's work, you cannot stay consistently engaged. Teams, however, are very different in their approach that we can have team members join in the activities and ministries of the church that are not even church members, people who have uh, come along, decided they wanted to attend Dorcas Wills, they want to get involved, find out if it's a place where they want to have their membership, they can immediately start serving on our team. And we have a number of teams that cover a lot of activities and ministry opportunities. And so we need people to sign up for them. We do not have a limited number on each team, but whatever it takes. There's no commitment for monthly meetings. You don't have to sign a long-term contract. You can just come and show up whenever you want to be involved and be a part of the team. And the beauty of the team concept is we can do more for the Lord in this church than we can with our committees. So there's options. This is good news. Well, today we invite you to come and see what options might be available that you have the knowledge, the skills, or the abilities to engage in. Come on over to the gym after services and find your perfect fit. Or fits. Or fits. Well, church, let's stand together and sing How He Loves. Just 
loves us so much that he gave his one and only son to come and die on the cross for our sins when we only deserve death. We don't deserve him, but he willingly gave us him.
thank you for loving us even when we're unlovable we thank you Lord for all you do for us we thank you for just being here for us at all times be with us Lord as we go through this day help us to do your will we thank you for this offering we're about to receive as it furthers your kingdom in Jesus name I pray amen, amen.
We have children who would like to go to children's church. Miss Jeanette is in the back. Y'all ready? Y'all take off. Do I have to tell them to run? No, because they're excited to go. Well, open your Bibles with me to Nehemiah chapter 2. Don't stand up yet. We're going we're gonna to do that in a moment. Let me lead into our message. There was an elderly couple, a man and a woman. They were spending a significant amount of time together. Neither had ever been married. They had lived alone for, for many years. But gradually, the old gentleman recognized that he was getting a real attachment to this fine lady. But he was shy. He was afraid to reveal his true feelings to her. But after many days of anxiety and fear, he finally mustered up enough courage to declare his intentions. And so he went over to, the, to her home and in a nervous frenzy blurted out, let's get married. And the lady thought for a moment, she was quite surprised, she threw her hands into the air, she shouted, it's a wonderful idea, but who would have us? <laughs> you know, many times in our life, we are, we are just like this man. We know what we would like, but we have not spent spend our time in, in preparation nor in planning. We fail to seek guidance for the plans that we do have. And so our attempts to carry them out often end in failure or in frustration. Nehemiah did not leave his plans to chance. In fact, he had prayed for God's leading. He had agonized over a plan, the rebuilding of the wall in Jerusalem. And when the time came for him to move forward, he was ready. He had prepared himself for victory. And that's where we want to be as well. So we want to read his story and apply these truths. We are working through the book of Nehemiah, and, and these things that we are learning help us right now as we are doing a lot of work in our building, as we are moving toward growing together, filling our teams, getting people tied in into the place of ministry where they best fit. I love that idea. What is your perfect fit? Well, if you are able now, stand with me. We'll read from Nehemiah chapter 2. Let's stand together again if you are able. Right in the first verse. Okay, here we are. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and I gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king said to me, what are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me, the queen said beside him, how long will you be gone, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given me to the governors of the province beyond the river that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked for the good hand of my God was upon me. Then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent with me officers of the army and horsemen. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. Let's pray together. Lord, we pray as we study your word today, that you would speak truth to our hearts, that we would see the tie between our faith and for good solid planning, 
that you would lead us as people to serve you. I pray even thinking ahead in what we will learn in the book of Nehemiah, that we each have a role. We each have a responsibility to the body of Christ to make it complete by our work. May we hear your words and be so motivated. Lord, may your spirit move in our hearts today. May it touch each one in this congregation. May we learn something today. And may we take it with us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Hudson Taylor, a deceased missionary, once said, It is possible to move men through God by prayer alone. And that is a wonderful quote. And as we continue today with our study, it has particular significance to us. As leaders, we will come to the point when, when those in authority over us and even the situations around us that seem greater than what we can handle, we need help. We need the help of God. And it is possible in those times that God can move the men, God can move the people, God can control the situation that we are facing so that it is all doable, if you accept that word. At these times, our choice is to pray. In Proverbs chapter 21, there's an illustration in this verse that prayer is always our best resort. There we read the king's heart is like channels of water in the hand of the Lord. Now, this Hebrew sentence would have begun with the word channels, referring to small irrigation ditches that ran from a main reservoir out into the dry flatlands. Hence, the rendering of this comparative proverb would have been like irrigation canals carrying water is the heart of the king in Jehovah's hand. So you hear this, this, this comparison beginning. The scripture reminds us that those making decisions around us, they are all in the Lord's hands. The king in all his glory is still subject to God. Amen. He is subject to God. And you ask the question, why? And there's, there's a one-word answer, sovereignty. And there's a two-word answer, God's sovereignty to that question. Why are these things controlled? Because God is in control of all things. We are told in Scripture that He is the creator of all things. And everything moves at His, his blessing, His thought, His direction, his, his, his instructions for us. God is sovereign. sovereign. So we, we see this per, first part of this proverb. It is comparative. Now look at this, the last part of the proverb. There we read, He directs it like a water course wherever he pleases. He directs it like a water course wherever he pleases. The Lord causes the king's heart to be bent toward what he pleases and what he desires. What is true for the king is also true for our, our superiors. If we are struggling at work, if we are struggling in other situations, that person's heart is still in the hands of the king. Where do we go? We go to prayer. When we're facing situations, again, that are beyond our understanding, beyond our capabilities, we go to the Lord in prayer. Nehemiah's experience with Artaxerxes illustrates this. And I don't know, we've read this passage, I believe, twice. And we see how Artaxerxes is, was one, he is the king of the land, one of the most powerful men of his day. And yet, Nehemiah has the confidence through God to go to him and make some requests. Nehemiah had now spent several months trying to determine the, the, what God's will was for him. Four months, in, pa in fact, had passed since Nehemiah received news from Jerusalem. We read of that in chapter 1. These people came to him from Jerusalem. They told him the condition of his city, how it had been destroyed and needed to be rebuilt. Four months. You know, we've, we've covered it in about three or four weeks. Four months. What had happened? In one sense, we could say nothing has happened because we can't see that anything has happened from our viewpoint. But, but something for us to note, God is so often at work even when we do not see Him working. He was at work here. Nehemiah had been praying. He had been planning. And then when the opportunity presented himself, he was ready. According to the historian Herodotus, 
There is a certain feast during the year when the Persian king would, would feel especially generous, especially generous. The feast may have been tied into the Persian New Year. Now, we read verse 1 of chapter 2, in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes. This is the new year for the Persians. So, so it may have been that right at this time, King Artaxerxes was, was feeling a special generosity. And I don't know that it was Nehemiah's great thinking or God's hand upon Nehemiah. I tend to think the latter, that God led Nehemiah to approach the king right at this moment. Nehemiah may have waited for this special time to present this request that he was making. And verse 1 suggests that Nehemiah even wanted the king to notice his sadness. I believe we spoke about this some last week. Nehemiah had never been sad before the king. And I believe he waited for this particular moment to draw the king into conversation. It was part of his plan to initiate discussion. Nehemiah had heard the news four months ago, and he kept that sadness hidden for four months. That's not like us, is it? You know, even, even I, I make a joke, but how long, all my golfing buddies, how long does it take you to know that I'm not happy with a shot? It's not four months. It's not even four seconds usually. It's, it's like right away. But I want you to think about the sense. There are things that we go through, we struggle with, and we're really, we really should be waiting for an answer, and we, we just throw it right out there. But Nehemiah held it, held it in and, and allowed God to work his heart, shaping his heart, shaping the discussions that would follow. You know, along that line is, is just, a, just another comment. A lot of times we, we come in and we may look haggard or tired. This, we put on the prayer face, the, the ashes and sackcloth. And instead of really waiting still on God in prayer, but not even involving others at that point, Nehemiah held, held things back. And he reports, honestly, at this moment, I was very much afraid. I was very much afraid. Uh, rightfully so. You know, if you came into the king's presence and reigned on his parade, do you know what would happen? You, you would be, I'm laughing, it's not funny, but you would be put to death. It is that serious. So Nehemiah was afraid at this moment. He had showed sadness before the king. He had reigned on the parade, and Nehemiah was admitting his human weakness. Now watch what happens in verses 3 and 4. Nehemiah responds. His response shows respect for his ancestors. His response mentions the shame at the condition of his city. And again, he didn't jump right into it. There, there are really political issues in play at this moment. He carefully avoids raising the king's suspicion by mentioning Jerusalem. He just says, my city, the city of my ancestors. And he was pushing and attempting to get the king's sympathy before he even made it clear what was going to, or needed to take place. Nehemiah showed skill in communication. Nehemiah showed skill, I would call it diplomacy. It was a very diplomatic way of handling things. He gets again the king's sympathy before going on with the details. When we act according to God's will, others take notice. And that's what's taking place right here. Nehemiah acting within the will of God, and the king, in this case, is taking notice. Now, Nehemiah's quick prayer, I, I know I addressed this last week, and I, verse 4, Then the king said to me, What are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of the heavens. And, and this quick prayer, this quick response, is, is not because it was the first time he ever prayed. He wasn't like, oh, he's ready to act. I better pray real quick. No, it goes back in those four months where he had been in communion with God. But he still, and this is okay, so he still at that moment said, help me, God. Help me, God. It's the prayer. I, I know a lot of y'all listen to David Jeremiah, and, and I mentioned this before, but I, it's worth repeating. The prayer when you're driving down the road sometimes and someone is headed right at you and you say, help me, God. Help me, God. It is that type of prayer. You don't have time to go to your closet or, or wherever you pray and get down on your knees. But, but 
because you have good relationship, good communication with God, you can pray those quick prayers. Nehemiah was completely dependent on the work of God in the king's heart at this moment. God, lead him. God, lead this king. And his response indicates his submissive spirit before the king. That was important. And then, so Nehemiah is responding with respect, but he gets the same thing back from the king. The king in verse 6 says this, How long will you be gone, and when will you return? You could tell that Nehemiah at that point had favor with the king. But why was that? Nehemiah had shown himself valuable to the king throughout his working career. He had been doing a good job. His attitude was positive. Take note. Everybody take note. I remember in college when, you know, as a college student, you're, you're pretty free to come and go, but I worked, and I worked at Kroger. And I remember one time there was a, a race over in Bristol, Tennessee. I worked in Blacksburg. Bristol's close enough. We want to go to a NASCAR race. And all my friends or the people working there said, just call in sick. I said, I'm not calling in sick. And I went to the boss and, and I said, look, there's a chance of me going to this uh, NASCAR race. Can I have off? And he said, sure. And I think the others were amazed, but it's, I would tell them, look, if you come to work and you do your job, when you need off, they let you off. And it's a similar thing here. Nehemiah had gained the favor of the king because he had been doing what he was supposed to do. We should do what we're supposed to do, especially as a Christian worker, especially. You should do it as a worker. You should especially do it as a Christian worker. Now, Nehemiah could, could now carry out the Lord's work at the command of a pagan king because he had a good record before the king. Here is a pagan king rebuilding God's holy city. So God had opened the door. Nehemiah jumped through with his full request. We saw that in verses 7 and 8. Letters, safety, and what else? He asked for wood to be given. Nehemiah had already planned so carefully, he knew the precise needs of rebuilding Jerusalem. Artaxerxes and, and I don't know if you knew this. This was a very important encounter. Artaxerxes had previously stopped the rebuilding. And I don't think I gave the reference, but if you'd like it, Ezra, chapter before, chapter 4, 17 through 22. This read of that, Artaxerxes had put a stop to the work. So to get it rolling again, this was a precarious moment, a very important moment. He asked for a letter of protection. He asked for a letter granting him timber. Beams for the gate, beams for the wall, and what else? Beams for his house. So he had all these things. And, and I picture it a little bit like this. You can ask my daughter if this works, but Nehemiah standing before the king, just like maybe a teenage daughter would stand before her father asking for a new skirt. Daddy, can I get a new skirt? Absolutely not. For me, it was a puppy. Daddy, can I get a puppy? Absolutely not. Well, Daddy bats the eyes and snuggles up and gets hugged. Okay, you can get the skirt. Well, Daddy, you know if I, I get the skirt, I really need a new blouse to go with it. You can get the blouse. Well, Daddy, to make this outfit complete, some shoes will just pull it all together. Get what you need. And, and, and my heart would be swayed by my daughter. But I picture it this way. It's not Nehemiah swaying our Xerxes. It is God swaying the heart of the king. So whatever that Nehemiah needed was given to him. Chuck Swindoll once said, God's work and our planning are not contradictory. And I, did I give, I don't think I wrote that out. I want to say it again. That's so important. God's work and our planning are not contradictory. The presence of faith does not mean that there is an absence of planning. Not at all. Now, tying, tying us together today, Chuck Smidall writes in his book, Hand Me Another Brick, he, he gives four principles for preparation. And I have given these to you in your bulletin. First is this, changing a heart is God's specialty. That is a specialty of God. Don't try to manipulate. Don't try to fit people into your specifications for them. Instead, 
Go tell God about them. Tell God about them. Tell God what the need is and let Him do the work. When the change comes, who gets the glory? It would be God. That's what we want anyway. Number two, praying and waiting go hand in hand. Praying and waiting go hand in hand. It's against our nature. <laughs> I, see, I see, I won't call names, but I see people shaking their heads. And, and I'm right there with you. That is against our nature. Our nature is to do what? Take charge, take over, take control. But the answer comes in us letting go of that control and letting God instead be in control of the moment. Jay White, in his book, Excellence in Leadership, notes, prayer is where planning starts. And so we pray and let the plan formulate within us and slowly move forward. Number three, faith is not a synonym for disorder or a substitute for careful planning. Leaders like Nehemiah think through very slowly the plans that they will face. Now, even, I, I, I just glanced at Rick and it kind of sprung to me. Any builders that we have in here, but I think we can all get this picture, we don't just go out on Monday morning and start digging. At least I hope not. There's got to be a plan that has been thought through because there needs to be first the foundation and then certain things need to happen even before the uh, cement is, is poured. you got to have your piping for electricity, also for water. I don't know exactly the whole process. But all these things do not happen or else you would always be backpedaling to correct something that you jumped ahead in. And so we've got to plan in the process. And these steps at times may be slow, but you can sh be sure that the cost has been counted. Right, Mr. Builder? Exactly. Take a moment, look in Luke 14. I don't believe I gave this to you either. Luke 14, chapter, I mean, chapter 14, verses 28 through 30. We'll read through, and, and I think it's just a reminder of what I just said. All right. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and, it is, and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. And, and you see the picture there. A little bit what I was speaking of before. Look, don't have, don't have Rick build for you would be this mocking. He started to build. He put the walls up before he ever laid the foundation. He bricked before he ever plumbed the house. He doesn't do that because there's planning involved as evidence here. You know, there, there are many people who claim faith will carry them who are actually being lazy. And, it will say, and, and one of the examples, and Suzanne and I talk about this from time to time, there, there are people who say a preacher should never use any notes. There are people who say a preacher should just, just preach, basically come in and wing it based on faith. And they make this argument. But I would make an argument in another other way that God uses my preparation my faith in Him leading me that way to be able to bring a message. And I know there are many preachers as, my, as me, as with me, that believe the same way. But some people would hide behind faith because they don't want to do the preparation. We always need to be prepared before we move forward. To be a person of faith does not mean you're not a person who plans. We need to remember the revolutionary saying, you remember this, you will, trust in God, but keep your powder dry. And that came out of the Revolutionary War. Number four, opposition is to be expected when God's will is carried out. The very last verse I read today finishes this way. It had displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. It, it is rare when you are carrying out the will of God, that there isn't some opposition. Amen. There, there's going to be something. A lady was talking to a man one day, and let me read her words exactly. She said, I've never met up with the devil. And the man very quickly said to her, well, maybe you were both heading in the, right, in the same direction, I mean, in the same direction. That's why you haven't met her. Met him. 
Well, I think about that picture. Because if you are serving and working for the Lord, you will face some opposition. You will face some trials. And, and we are people. Sometimes it's right in our midst. Sometimes we don't intend to be used by Satan, but we actually are used by Satan to create a push apart. God desires unity. He wants that within us. Keep fighting. Be prepared for victory. I'm reading something to you. I, I, I came across this last week, and it, it's so old. Please forgive me, but I, but I think it's an encouragement. Two frogs fell into a deep cream bowl. One was an optimistic soul, but the other took the gloomy view. I shall drown, and so will you. So with a last despairing cry, he closed his eyes and said, Goodbye. But the other frog with a merry grin said, I can't get out, but I won't give in. I'll swim around till my strength is spent. For having tried, I'll die content. Bravely he swam until it would seem his struggles began to churn the cream. On the top of the butter, at last he stopped. And out of the bowl, he happily hopped. What is the moral? It's easily found. If you can't get out, keep swimming around. Forgive me, but, it, but, but be encouraged. I think about Nehemiah. Nehemiah had a cushy life. We talked about that. He was in a great position. But he allowed God, through his relationship with God, to give him a vision. And it was a vision for the rebuilding, and he would not stop until the rebuilding took place. He allowed God to galvanize his heart. We read in chapter 2, already there's opposition. Believe me, as we go forward, there will be more and more opposition for him to face. There will be more struggles that he has to push through. We may go as far to say that God-sized missions will bring upon us God-sized opposition. What do I call you to do? Be deep in prayer. Let your relationship be so strong with God that you know the way forward. I don't know if you knew this, but when the Gettysburg Battleground became a national cemetery, Edward Everett was called upon to give the dedication speech. Now, who did you think I was going to say? Abraham Lincoln is who I would have thought. Well, Abraham Lincoln was also asked to give some appropriate comments for the day. Everett spoke eloquently for one hour and 57 minutes. And you think preachers go long. One hour and 57 minutes. He took his seat as the crowd roared enthusiastically their approval for what he said. Then President Lincoln stood to his feet. He slipped on his steel spectacles and he began to deliver what, we, what is known today as the Gettysburg Address. But what was really the Gettysburg Address had already been offered. But he stood up and he spoke. Very poignant words. Do you know it was 10 sentences that he spoke, and I think he was up there less than two minutes. This is very quick. Part of the word, words, and I love these, the world will little note nor long remember. And suddenly he was finished. No more than two minutes after he began, he had stopped, and he, he, he had talked in a way that was prayerful. It, it, it almost seemed inappropriate to applaud and so he went and he kind of fell back into a seat. And as he did so, a man by the name of John Young, he worked for the Philadelphia Press, he leaned over and he whispered to President Lincoln, is that all? And President answered, yes, that is all. And, and I pull it all together now with these thoughts. Depth of our relationship with God, depth in our praying, not length is what is important. If you want to be prepared for victory, never underestimate the need for being in God's presence. Pray, as Scripture says, pray continually. Let's stand, let's stand and pray together. Lord, we are grateful for our time together today. And I pray that these words have encouraged us as a church, challenged us as, as people to be men and women of prayer, Lord, we have a great task before us. We pray that you would 
instill within us your plan, your way of providing, and that we would work and we would plan as though it depended upon our planning, but knowing full out that you are in control here. You are in charge here. Lord, I pray for this day. I thank you for the time for us all to be together, both services. I look forward now as we move from here over to to spend some time in our ministry tables and around the table of fellowship together. But before we leave, Lord, may we finish a commitment that you called us to. Perhaps there is one or more who have been called into relationship with you. Maybe they've never given their heart to you and they're ready to do it this way. If that describes your heart right now, your position, won't you pray with me? Dear Lord Jesus, I need you. Dear Lord Jesus, I need forgiveness of my sin. Invite him to come into your heart and forgive you. Invite him to live within you. And if you made that decision, don't keep it secret. Step out even now. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Step out. Come forward and say, Brother Sam, I just asked Jesus into my heart. Perhaps you have another need. I invite you to come and to pray with me or with Sam or to come and kneel at this altar right in front, right at these steps and present your request to God. Know that that is an okay thing to do. Perhaps God has led you here this day to unite with Dorcas Wills. Maybe you've been visiting in a while and you know God has you and wants you in this place to complete or bring toward completion the family that He is building. Lord, may Your Spirit move in our midst, leading us to decision, leading us into deeper relationship with You. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As Ethan leads us in, I have decided to follow Jesus. If you have a need, if you would like to come and kneel at these steps and pray, you do that today. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back. I cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. God's people said, Amen. Amen. I am so glad you are here today, all of you, and I hope you will all take the chance to move over to the Blue Building, our our gymnasium, see our ministry fair. If you are concerned about the long walk, we have a golf cart. If you go down the elevator and straight out those doors, there's a golf cart. Just wait there patiently. We're going back and forth. We will have people surrounding the tables. One thing I want you to note, Lynn, come over here for a minute. I'm not, I'm not gonna, you see this shirt that Lynn is wearing? Turn around and let everybody see. We, are, we have some new shirts that you may order today. Linda Gunnels will be there at the table, so we'll have some possibilities for you to do that and get yourself official and official Dorcas Wills Memorial Baptist Church shirt. All right? All right, I think that might be it. But, oh, oh no, it's not it if I don't say this. If you're visiting with us today, I don't care if the only thing you brought was an appetite. I don't care. Come over and eat with us. There's plenty. There's plenty. We want you to do that. 
Now, anybody need to, me to bring anything else up? Daryl, will you close us in prayer? And then we'll move over to the gym, and then after that to eat. Brother Daryl. Amen. 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 You are dismissed.